Hey guys, how's it going? It's X666X Iron Maiden. Today we're finally finishing off Extra Histories, Catherine the Great, with uh, part 6 called Succession. Alright, so, uh, as I've been saying for all the videos that I'm recording today, this is actually my second time reacting to this. I already uploaded the video once. Uh, and then once all my videos were uploaded, I realized that my mic didn't pick up any of my voice throughout any of the videos, even though it was plugged in and wasn't muted. Something weird happened, so I have to redo all the videos. This is technically my second time seeing this. I just wanted to put that out there right away. Uh, but I did still want to put it out, of course, because it's the ending of uh, Catherine the Great's story. So, without further ado, let's jump in and check it out. Once the terror of Eastern Europe, Poland had long been in decline. Catherine aimed to make that decline permanent. When Catherine first made war on the Ottomans, the biggest losses ended up being suffered by the Poles rather than the mm -hmm. Ottoman Empire. For years, Catherine had a puppet, a former lover on the throne of Poland, but keeping him there, and keeping him doing the bidding of Russia, was becoming more and more difficult. Vast amounts of yep. troops and treasure were required to keep Poland passive, and, as you might remember, the first Russo-Ottoman conflict was, at least officially, caused by Russian troops chasing Polish rebels over the border into Ottoman territory. But Poland was at the center of everything, literally. The three great powers mm -hmm. in Eastern Europe at the time were Prussia, Austria, and Russia, and in the middle of all of them sat Poland. So Poland became the solution for a very thorny problem that faced the King of Prussia, Frederick the Great. You see, Frederick had agreed to a secret alliance with Catherine, but the terms of it were very specific. If either of them fought with one of the other powers, all the other had to do was provide some financial support. But if either was attacked and ended up fighting two powers, well, the other one had to go all in joining their side. Now, Frederick really didn't like the idea of actually militarily supporting Russia. He wanted them on his side and all, but the Seven Years' War had really done a number on his forces and his treasury. And in the Ottoman yep. conflict, Russia was being a true pain and stomping the Turks far more than anybody really thought they would, which of course worried Austria, who needed the Ottomans as a counterbalance to Russia. Naturally, this meant that the Austrians were about to join the war on the Ottoman side, which would mean that Frederick would have to do the very boring and unfun act of honoring his treaty. But Frederick was a crafty fellow. He yep. pondered the problem and did what he seems to have usually done, and asked himself, how can I kill a whole bunch of birds with one stone? Because he really wanted a couple of things. First, he didn't want to have to send troops to fight some Russian war. Second, he wanted the Ottomans to owe him, in case he ever needed to use them against the Austrians or the Russians. And then there was this thorny issue of that big gap in his territory, making it much harder to defend. So, he proposed a solution. Rather than Russia continuing to kick the Turks around and taking large portions of their territory, what if they took a big piece of Poland instead? And then, to maintain the balance of power, Austria could go in and take the most populous parts of Poland, and him, well, he would just take this wee bitty bit over there, a bit that happened to be the most strategically important for him, and provided him more ports on the Baltic. So his solution was proposed, and basically everybody was like, eh, sure, I said it in the original and video so, that with when you go back to our other extra histories Russian and all that, you can see this is the start of Poland getting completely taken the over. Polish version of a parliament to ratify the agreement. Of course, not enough members showed up to actually ratify the thing, but that wouldn't be a problem. The first thing those who did show up decided to do was change the rules. And thus, huge segments of Poland became Russian, Austrian, and Prussian overnight. From then on, any time Poland did anything Russia didn't like, Russia would just send the troops in. Then Prussia would suggest that they all just take another bite out of Poland, until finally, near the end of Catherine's rule, everyone just agreed to do away with the nuisance that was the ever-in-revolt state of Poland. But as Catherine's life came to its close, yeah. and the last chapter in the reign of Catherine the Great was being penned, so that part all we already thoughts had were on before. one thing, the succession. And here, perhaps, this for all so of Catherine's triumphs, was her greatest failing. The place where her own weaknesses and insecurities show through. The tragedy of her reign was that she left behind no one to carry on her legacy. After her, Russia would never again have a truly great emperor. 
Her son would grow up to be like the husband Catherine had despised. When he was born, little Paul had been whisked away by the then Empress Elizabeth. For eight years, Elizabeth had had maids and servants raise the boy, and when he was at last returned to Catherine, there was a distance between them that could never be bridged. The young man expected the warmth and attention that he'd never received during those years apart from his mother, and while Catherine tried, Paul would always be jealous of the men in Catherine's life, as she seemed to focus more of her energy on them than yeah. on him. And this was compounded by Catherine's own paranoia. She saw her son not as an assistant and an heir, but as a potential rival, as the one person who might have a more legitimate claim to the throne than she. So she kept him away from the halls of government, away from any responsibility, from being an actor in the affairs of state. And slowly, he took to idolizing the father who might not have been his father. He would play with soldiers and march his servants around like Peter had. Catherine and her closest advisors eventually decided this had to stop, and so they sought a wife for him, hoping that being married might make him grow up. But his first marriage ended in deep tragedy. His wife died in the birth of their first son, and their son died with her. And as he was going through her papers, Paul discovered that she'd been carrying on an affair with his closest friend. He was laid low with grief. But he was convinced to marry again for the sake of the state. His new wife was perfect for him. She supported him, eased his anxiety. Together they toured Europe, where for the first time he was fated and treated like a ruling member of some great state. And in these few months, you can see this possibility, this glimmer of hope in the letters the rulers of Europe wrote to one another upon meeting this young man, that he might be something more than his father. Was he perfect? Well, no, but they all remark on him being capable, intelligent, and when his wife was at his side, able to let go of the anxiety and the paranoia that plagued him. But when he returned from Europe and asked to be part of the cabinet, Catherine again dismissed him, telling him that his trip had made him put on airs. He asked to fight in the army, and she said no. On every front, she Jeez. still kept him from having any it's, of the responsibility uh, of state. And so this is way back before, back you know, anxiety, anxiety and, and depression paranoia. and as paranoia. He grew older, they have no idea rumors about abounded all that Catherine stuff was going to disinherit him for then, one of his own like, sons. Now, whether she actually did or not is one of those historical questions that we'll never really have an answer. Some say that she left instructions in her will to pass the empire to her grandson, but that Paul had had that will destroyed before anyone could discover it. Others say that she died before she made up her mind on the issue. But Catherine, forgetting some of the pains of her own childhood, let her insecurities prevent her from giving her son the training or the care that he needed to rule. In the end, his paranoia became a self-fulfilling prophecy, and he would be assassinated not long into his reign. And the last Makes days sense. for Catherine saw other steps backward as well. The Pugachev Rebellion had convinced her to step back from granting rights to the serfs, something that she had considered doing in her younger days. And now the French Revolution made her doubt all of the Enlightenment ideas that she had so loved, and that in some ways had helped her carry her country so far. She banned private printing presses, and made all works be approved by a censorship office. She even stopped the circulation of books by some mm, of the very fair. men she had corresponded with in her youth. And so, in the end, mm, on the 17th of November, the 1796, Catherine died of a stroke, leaving behind her a Russia that was larger, stronger, and more developed than ever before. She had championed health, maternal rights, and education. She had expanded the country on every border, from Poland to Georgia to Alaska. She patronized the arts, built great palaces and wonders like the Hermitage. Under her, the army had gone from a second-rate power scoffed at in the halls of Europe to something feared the world round. She issued the first Russian banknote and brought the Enlightenment to Russia. And though she began to step back from that enlightenment and left Russia with a dynasty incapable of completing her legacy, it cannot be said that she was anything but the great. All right. That's cool, though. I mean, I, I never knew the ending to her, to her story. I, I think I said it before throughout the series that I do some information about her um, through my own little bit of research and through other videos, uh, Epic Rap Battles of History, uh, used Catherine the Great in uh, one of their uh, battles where you kind of learn like little bits and pieces of her story. Um, also, she was in Civilization 5, I do believe, or maybe it was 4, uh, one, of the, one of the two, um, where you can do a little bit of you know background on her as well. 
Uh, so I knew some things, but uh, all the more in-depth stuff that we learned from this series, I, I did not know it. And it was cool to learn. Uh, it's cool to see like how at the start, it, it shows like sometimes as you get older and stuff like that, you start to, you always progress, right? Throughout your whole life. So moving away from certain things at the end kind of like makes sense uh, in general. But you also see like many things like uh, there's a lot of trust issues back in the day. We're learning that through a lot of the extra history, you know, like nobody trusted each other. It was like always trying to backstab each other, which is still big today. But uh, not trusting your son um, probably wasn't the best move. And if with today's like medicine, stuff like that, and knowing that maybe he has like anxiety and depression might actually change that. You never know. It's hard to say, but uh, it's still a huge part of history, obviously, for especially Russia. As I, I, as I knew before coming in, is that she was known for really revolutionizing so many things for Russia and making them such a great power, uh, which is really cool. It's really cool to learn about that anyway. So I know we have, this has been it finally for Catherine the Great. Sorry it took so long to get to. Uh, I didn't mean to get to it for a long time, so finally had the chance. And, of course, we have other extra history uh, to check out as well. I won't tell you which ones right now. We'll get to them uh, soon enough, though. So anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed checking out the series of Catherine Agree with me. If you did, make sure you hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe to see more from me. And as always, you guys have a good one. I'll catch you later.